Let me turn now to Audrey Tong, the Minister Without Portfolio in the Government of Taiwan. Uh, you've been active, uh, Audrey, in bringing the experience of Taiwan during the coronavirus pandemic to other countries. Um, what are some of the main messages or lessons that you've been taking to other countries about how technological tools um, can help build trust and transparency in the technology ecosystem relating to the public health challenges? Thank you for the great Thank question. Great question. Uh, the main message is to work not just for the people, uh, but with the people. Every year, the human rights organization Civicus, with around 20 regional partners, conduct research about freedom and civic space. And Taiwan has been rated as completely open for three consecutive years. We're the only Asian country with that distinction and the sole Asian green light on this year's Civicus Monitor. So how do we come so far on this path? The key factor is that the internet in Taiwan has developed alongside democratization. Between the lifting of the martial law in 1987 and the presidential election in 96, we saw the popularization of PCs and the World Web in the span of 10 years. So for Taiwanese people, democracy is like a social technology. It can only be enriched through the joint efforts of all. Therefore, our government insists that broadband is a human right, reducing the cost for civic technologies. Our network infrastructure allows everyone to broadcast live from Jade Mountain, Taiwan's highest peak. We believe that a completely open environment with free speech uncensored is perfect for letting digital democracy flourish. And with our 23 million citizens using the internet as space for democracy, we fought off the pandemic with no lockdowns and the infodemic with no takedowns. In 2019, when news about the pandemic just started, our pro-social social media platform here allowed timely response to early warnings. In the face of global challenges, digital democracy has proven to be the most effective solution. This SMS-based contact tracing system is a great example. To eliminate community transmission, contact tracing must be done rapidly and effectively, of course. Inaccurate information would put us in the dilemma of having to choose between protecting privacy and preventing the pandemic. So rolling out a mandatory government app, we think it would only backfire. So instead of centralizing contact tracing data or yielding control to multinational corporations, we sought social sector solutions with the people. Earlier this year, the civic technologists in the G0V or Gov0 community invented this mechanism of contact tracing based on text messages. We work across sectors with telecom carriers to deploy this 1922 SMS system in a week. As you can see, scanning a QR code with the built-in camera, no app download required, sending a toll-free text message, people can't keep track of their itineraries. This allows contact tracer to confirm the footprints of infected people and their contact without revealing any private information to venue owners. And this collaboration cannot happen without this strong trust across sectors. Of course, we need to bridge the digital gap for the elderly and visually impaired. So contact tracing can still be done through measures such as handwriting or stamping. But when contact tracers apply for information about certain phone numbers, they submit requests through the civic platform to browse them. The phone number holder can then reverse audit contact tracers' requests and activities. All records are deleted after 28 days. And because the civic tech originates from a community that has always valued personal data sovereignty, we can respond to new challenges with timely improvements. For instance, text messages sent to 1922 were discovered by a judge assessing a police search warrant. Fortunately, this multi-party secure design prevented the police from accessing the mapping between the random codes and the specific venues. So the judge denied the warrant and publicly questioned the legality of even wiretapping text sent to 1922. Following discussions, our Ministry of Justice concluded that this SMS does not constitute communication under the Communication Security and Surveillance Act and therefore should not be repurposed for law enforcement, keeping the original civic intent intact. Rule by the people is the original intent of democracy. In the face of global threats such as the pandemic and disinformation, our Taiwan model shows that the world that this people-public-private partnership with the people can shape a digital democracy. Trusting our citizens to participate in policymaking can form shared goals, develop innovative solutions, and contribute to the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Tong. That's truly an impressive uh, demonstration you've given of just one element of what I know would be a whole suite of experiences and tools and innovations that Taiwan has put forward. So in a way, I wish we could dedicate more time to that because uh, 
I know in this country we could use many of these innovations, but I salute you and your colleagues in the government and in the society for having moved so far. So um, let me turn first to Audrey Tong. Would you have some hearing these presentations and further to what you were saying before? I'm hoping you can offer just a few more thoughts on where we are. Certainly. So um, I've heard a lot about the digital public infrastructures, just like reliable infrastructure making our lives safer and more convenient. Public infrastructure in the digital realm does the same for democracy. And I've got an example here. Um, in 2015, Civic Technologies invented Airbox, a low-cost air quality tracker adopted by many schools and households balconies here. And citizen science supplemented our government's limited capacity and paved the way for data stewardship and environmental education. And the following year, our government initiated this civil IoT Taiwan program, which the first time we classified infrastructure budget uh, into the digital realm. Uh, and at the time, there were just around 2,000 devices, and today there's tens of thousands. And we move on from that step of sharing data to forming shared goals through AI or assistive intelligence. For instance, in 2015, many passengers welcomed Uber's entry to Taiwan, but also triggered taxi driver discontent, and again, with the help from the G0 Week of Zero community, we utilize the police system here to invite stakeholders to resonate with each other's feelings. We've learned that shared values are hiding in plain sight. For example, safety is a value on which all parties agree, and a rough consensus was formed around professional license, uh, insurance, and taxes, all ratified in a diversified taxi program in 2016. The same setting also works for multilateral topics. During the past couple of years, the AIT at 40, Digital Dialogues, and COHAC, International Hackathon both use the public system here with the visualized spectrum of ideas. Participants around the world can see where they stand compared with others. So we can co-create a norm or a good enough consensus. So I think to close off, we need to institutionalize the rapid deployment of such social innovations. Our presidential hackathon, for example, has been held for four consecutive years with thousands of social entrepreneurs and public servants participating alongside teams from dozens of countries to contribute to the digital public goods. Five teams each year received this trophy, you see, uh, carrying the presidential promise of support in the next fiscal year. So to conclude, I urge all three countries to invest, like Taiwan does, in civic technologies to strengthen democracy. As I've said in our national statement, to give no trust is to get no trust. As democracy, we must trust our citizens, and Taiwan can help.